Organic chemists use the orbital concept almost on a daily basis and will use orbitals throughout the semester to describe organic structure and reactivity in great detail. Essentially, the question that orbitals set out to answer is where are electrons located in space and how stable are they? Quantum mechanics specifies that we can't pin down the exact position of the electron, but we can learn its probability at a particular point. Orbitals reflect this probability. They're shapes in space in which we can expect to find electrons. This video introduces the orbital concept, and throughout this lesson, we'll develop the idea that the orbitals of molecules, molecular orbitals, are built from the fundamental atomic orbitals. And there aren't that many fundamental atomic orbitals. So we can come to understand molecular orbitals, which dictate the reactivity of molecules more specifically, in terms of the atomic orbital building blocks. And you'll see that played out throughout this lesson. To lay out the orbital concept, I'd like to first begin with the problem that orbitals solve. And then we'll talk about the character of the solution, what orbitals actually look like, conceptually how you should think about them, and how they come about in the first place. So to set up the problem, let's look at a hypothetical molecule, say water. And say we know the atomic positions, and we're interested in finding out where the electrons are. The two key questions of the problem associated with orbitals. Where are the electrons located in space? And what are their energies or their stabilities? How reactive are they, essentially? What the problem boils down to is finding two things. One is a function over all space that specifies the probability of finding an electron at a particular point. Quantum mechanics tells us that we can't pin down the position of the electron. We can only describe the probability of finding it at a particular point in space. This function f is that probability function, and finding that function is the essence of the orbital problem. And as far as the energies are concerned, associated with the function f is this energy e, which is just a value, and we want to find that as well. This is a pretty complex problem, actually. To illustrate some of the complexities associated with the problem. If we just lay down the number of electrons that we would expect within the water molecule, one thing to notice right off the bat is that the electrons are all negatively charged, and so they will repel one another. There's important electronic repulsion going on. So the probability of finding one electron at its point depends on the positions of all the other electrons at the same time. The motions are what we call correlated. But this introduces enormous complexities because now the function f is not just a function of the position of the electron we're interested in, but also all the other electrons at the same time. The number of variables balloons to unmanageable proportions, even for the smallest of molecules, even for this very simple eight electron molecule, things are getting out of hand. To determine the solution of this problem and describe the positions and energies of all the electrons within complex molecules, a number of simplifications are made. One of the most important ones is that we forget about this correlation between movements, and we basically say, okay, there's one function for every electron, and that function is only related to the overall structure of the molecule, so we specify its structure, and the position in space that we're interested in, x, y, and z. The solution really boils down to three important aspects. Orbitals are described by their occupancy. The number of electrons either contained within them is what we primarily say. Another way to put this is the number of electrons characterized by a particular function, f, that's the occupancy, the energy, which is that energy value E, and their shape. And the shape is essentially related to the shape of the function F. What does it look like overall space? Because of this approximation we've made that the motions are uncorrelated, there needs to be an orbital for every electron in the molecule. And one of the important ideas is that each electron has its own unique orbital or wave function that characterizes its position and energy. To illustrate that, we use what are called orbital energy diagrams. And on these, 
you'll see a number of energy levels with the horizontal lines indicating the energy, the Y or vertical axis is energy, and up and down arrows to indicate the number of electrons characterized by that orbital or within that orbital, as we say. And associated with each of these is a particular shape or a particular function that we can draw next to the line or that's commonly actually left out. For the water molecule, we would have one orbital for each of the electrons, and since each function can accommodate two electrons, spin up and spin down, we would have at least four levels. In fact, there would be even more that would come out of a calculation of the orbitals for water, as you'll see. So the three most important ideas associated with every orbital are occupancy, energy, and shape. That's very important to keep in mind. Now let's dive into this concept of shape in a little more detail. If I draw just a hypothetical nucleus here with, say, a p orbital around it, the shape tells us where the electron is likely to be found in space. And essentially, you can think of it as a container. Inside the container, there is a high probability of finding the electron, let's say greater than 95% in this case. Everywhere outside of the container, there's a very low probability, let's say less than 5% outside of that container. Since the probability of finding an electron goes to zero very quickly as you move away from the nucleus, we can use these containers to illustrate an otherwise overly complex function. Shape is a function of three variables, really, the position in space, so we need some sort of three-dimensional contour or color map to really fully describe an orbital in three-dimensional space. These containers allow us to do that much more simply. An orbital shape is a very powerful construct to use it tells us two things, primarily. One, we can get the spatial aspects of reactions from the orbital shape. So if we know the molecular orbital that's most reactive, let's say it's F2, hypothetically, we know where the electrons are in space that are reacting. And this can indicate to us how the molecules will come together as they react. The other thing you can get out of orbital shape is site selectivity. So again, if we know the important orbital that's reacting, we can look for the largest concentration of electrons, which corresponds to the largest lobe in that orbital, and that's going to, to point us to the most reactive atom in the compound. An important principle you should know about orbital theory is that these orbital energy diagrams are primarily calculated particularly if we want them to really reflect reality, they need to be calculated because finding them a priori is extremely difficult for all but the simplest of molecules. Anything bigger than essentially H2 is going to be very difficult to calculate from first principles. There's a way we can get around this. We will use computational tools to calculate orbitals early on in the semester, but moving forward, what we'll do primarily is use the Lewis structure to generate what we'll call localized MOs. So we can go from the Lewis structure directly to localized MOs, which are rough approximations of what the actual MOs look like, but are extremely useful for predicting reactivity and structure. The nice thing about localized MOs is that they have standard shapes. Not only do they have standard shapes, but each of those shapes is correlated with a particular component of Lewis structures. There's a shape for a lone pair. There's a shape for a sigma bond. There's a shape for a pi bond. And knowing these will point you directly to the shapes of the localized MOs in any structure, no matter its size. The other thing is that they have standardized energies. The nice thing about standard energies is we can simply look at a Lewis structure and think about the relative reactivity and the relative stability of the electrons within it by using this standardized energy. Essentially what we find, just to give you a quick example of this, is that lone pairs are high in energy, pi bonds come in below lone pairs, and sigma bonds are the lowest energy electrons. 
vice versa for the corresponding unfilled localized MOs. Empty atomic orbitals come in at the lowest, pi star orbitals above those, and sigma star orbitals are the highest in energy. So those standardized energies are really nice for predicting reactivity simply by looking at a Lewis structure. Even though we don't need to calculate the localized MOs, it's important to understand that they still possess these three important concepts of occupancy, energy, and shape. Recognizing that every orbital is associated with these three ideas and understanding how to use the ideas to predict structure and reactivity will make you a master of the orbital concept.